sure and never know. Um, so this thought came to me this morning as we were praying before the service that sometimes um, when you, you, know, you first dump that cup of water on the plant, it pools up on the top and you're not sure like, uh oh, is it going to run off or what's going to happen? And then just if you wait just a moment, it just slowly kind of soaks in. Uh, sometimes church, I think, can come so quick uh, and we move through some things that sometimes it doesn't soak in or maybe it can run off. So if you want to go ahead and have a seat for just a minute, uh, I'd like to just read a few scriptures over us as a church. Uh, I'm going to read them, and we're going to pause for just a moment. And I want to ask you to let the truth of these words soak in. So this is part of worship. We're going to listen to the word of God and let it soak in. And then some of these songs even that we're singing, um, actually one of them I know for sure comes from some of these words that we're going we're gonna to read through. 
So I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Let it soak in. of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Let it soak in. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him my salvation, and my God. Let it soak in. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, God is our refuge and strength. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. Let it soak in. slides. Uh, we're going to sing a little bit about this in this next song. Let's read together. For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief for my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow, my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. But I trust in you, O Lord. You are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. So take a moment, let it soak in. resonating with that truth, declare it this morning. Let's continue worshiping the Lord.
giving our tithes and offerings. I'm asking you to close your eyes for a moment uh, while the ushers come. So we started out the service again this morning, like just let the truth of the word of God soak in. So Lord Jesus, we ask you to come. Holy Spirit, come. sound off, but Holy Spirit, I'm not asking you to fill this place, but I am asking you to fill our hearts, fill us with your presence, and in that, fill this place. So we give these tithes and offerings to you today, Jesus. They are yours. They belong to you. May they grow your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray.
by uh, celebrating the, the move up of children. Uh, so I've asked Angelo to come and pray over that because most of the ministries that are affected by that are his. So take it away, man. So um, Miss Belinsky, that name probably doesn't mean anything to you, but to me, it means a lot. When I was uh, in the Catholic Church and at CCD, uh, I had a first grade teacher named Miss Belinsky. And I remember still moving up to second grade, and I actually would like sneak out of class to try to go back into her class because I knew that she loved me. Like I, I knew that she genuinely cared about me and she wanted to be there with me. And that is the atmosphere that I want for the kids that get to come back with me and some of the other teachers and leaders to experience God's word. And we have some new faces in here, some first graders around us. And so I am so excited to have you in my class. I'm no Miss Belinsky, but I hope that what your kids experience in Treasure Seekers is a place of love and a place where God is honored as we study his word. So would you just, uh, if there's a kid around you, would you just lay hands on them as we just uh, prepare to ask the Holy Spirit to just lead us, to lead our kids deeper and deeper into his word. God, I want to first personally thank you for someone like Miss Belinsky in my life. But God, over the kids in this room, I want to ask that you would surround them with adults that love them, with adults that want to see the spiritual development of these kids happen. And so God, as we uh, dismiss our kids. We want to just release blessing over them. Would your spirit be with them as we pursue after just you and your love and the things that you have to say to them? So Jesus, we thank you. We just pray in your name. Amen. Kids for treasure seekers, you're free to go. And then sixth graders, you guys get to stay here with us today. All right, yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys can have a seat. Our kids are heading out. They're ready to go. All right. So sixth graders, I want to welcome you. Uh, I don't know how many of you are in here, uh, but uh, this first announcement won't apply to you, uh, but it does apply to your parents, so feel free to nudge them and poke them and ask them if they're going. Uh, part of our Truth for Living courses this fall, uh, we have a marriage oneness course. Uh, we have room for 20 couples. Uh, so uh, we'd love for you guys to get into this. If you're thinking about getting married, already married, you've been married for a long time, it'd be an excellent way to invest in your marriage. So that'll be Sundays at 11 a.m. It starts next week. And then uh, we also have a, a gathering called Leadership Community. And one of the things that we want to do is make sure that uh, all the things we're leading are marked by the presence of God. So as leaders, we wanted to spend some time praying and worshiping together. Uh, if we're going to lead in prayer, let's get together and pray together. Uh, so Leadership Community is happening September 27th, uh, 6.30 to 9. Uh, so you know that's happening. And then all the other steps that you can sign up for are on lfhchurch.org slash info. Uh, and in just a moment, uh, George is going to come teach us, uh, so you're going to want to find the book of Genesis. Uh, but while you find that, uh, we have a little video we want to show you about a special needs course uh, that uh, is available uh, to, some, uh, to some kids who have some challenges, and we want to make sure that you're in the loop on that. Uh, so Laura is going to tell us about this in this video. And I am mom of a special needs child. Those people who have special needs in their life maybe have a kid who can't sit through worship or they themselves have a special need um, that makes coming to worship hard. They feel that same level of, what do I do? I can't go there. I don't belong there. When you're not someone who has special needs in your life, it's easy to forget that that is so isolating. Coming here and talking to Sarah Bates, she had that same desire on her part, and the Holy Spirit was speaking to both of us about this needs to happen. We kind of formed this group of people in our church who have a heart for special needs. We want to help 
um, them to feel safe and welcome and for their families to feel safe and welcome. So we're starting out small, second Sundays, um, second service, and it is for kids through the ages of like four or five years old up to about 11 or 12. We have a, um, a form they can fill out and we will go over it like piece by piece, every little detail. We want to know what makes this child shine, what makes them special, because they have the same ability to bless others, to be part of God's kingdom that everybody else does. You can contact Sarah Bates. She has the forms so that you can fill them out, and that way we can help you um, find your place and help you feel welcome and help you feel safe with your child here. That's amazing. Chris, um, am I okay? All right, there we go. I have two grandchildren who have special needs. Uh, both have been adopted, one from Albania, one from Ukraine. You know, I'm going to confess something that's a little weird, but before Alec became part of our home, I would see a family with a child who had special challenges, and I would sort of feel sorry for the family. Now that Alec is part of our family, I feel sorry for families who don't. Because I've seen the beauty of how God works in the broken. And how God works in what we label as broken, but I'm not so sure God labels as broken. And that's the beauty of who he is. The beauty of who he is is that there is not one of us in this room that has borne a label given by someone else that God doesn't want to relabel and bring the truth of who we are out. And it's sort of curious that this was announced today because one of the things I want to look at is how Joseph, um, in the process of, and you could turn to Gen uh, Genesis chapter 45, how Joseph encountered God and experienced God in exile. Now, um, I think... Um, Joseph, in exile, really had three things he looked at or had to experience. He had to face prejudice. He had to face change. And he had to face crazy family. How many of you uh, would dare to say publicly, yeah, I got a crazy family, like we have a crazy thing here, right? Yeah, crazy family. The first time I heard somebody say that about their family, I thought, that's an awful thing to say. And then I got to know this family, and I went, they're right. They are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow it gave me freedom to look at the fact that life is just crazy. And you put any group of fruits in a bowl, and you're going to get some kind of weird fruit salad out of the whole thing. And God comes in the middle of that. So, your mic is on your shirt collar. Okay, thank you for that note. This is amazing. <laughs> do I rip the collar off or do I, what do I do? You know, okay, there we go. Genesis 45. I'm not going to read this whole portion of scripture, but I am going to take us through a few things as soon as I find my notes. I am, I am a person that sometimes leaves my notes um, on my desk at home, but today I didn't. So, Chapter 45, verse 1, this is the New International Version. And it talks about Joseph. As you will remember, Greg was talking about the banquet, the, the, the lunch that they were having. Joseph was sitting probably on a dais. The Egyptians were sitting over uh, at a separate section, and the scripture tells us they were doing it because they felt like eating with Jews was dis detestable. I call that prejudice. I don't want to eat with those people. Have you ever heard that statement made? You may have even made that statement at some time. And you go, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to be around those people. So... 
the chapter 45 starts out with Joseph saying, saying, telling us, the scripture telling us that Joseph could control himself no longer. He could no longer control himself before his attendants. This helps us understand how, what a weird situation Joseph was in. He is the second most powerful leader of a nation that hates his people. And he's sitting there in the emotion of a moment, seeing his brothers who have sold him into slavery. Can you get next to the emotion of that? What would that feel like? You see, the scripture gives, God gives us imagination. So when we come to scripture, we're not just looking at just hold card cold hard facts. We're looking at it from what would it be like if I were there? What would it be like to be the second most powerful person in a country, seeing the people who sold you into slavery, knowing that these people don't want to sit with those people, and you are in the middle of it all? And that's where Joseph is. And it says that he finally got to the point where he was going to lose his decorum. That's the way I would see it. He was going to lose it. And, and as, as the second most powerful leader in a country, you don't want to lose it in front of the people you're leading. So he sends the attendants out. He sends them away. And can you imagine if you were to, if you were to see this in a movie, like the maids and the, and the, and the uh, waiters are like listening at the door, like what's going on in there? And what they hear is a wail of pain coming out of this man that is so loud, the whole house hears it. And it's so, it's so uh, unusual and so disturbing that people begin to tell people in Pharaoh's household, if Pharaoh even hears about it. Now, we can assume Pharaoh had some spies in Joe's house, maybe, I don't think so. But people were telling the story just like we do among ourselves. How many of you heard a story about something where somebody did something somewhere? All you got to do is go on the internet. And so Pharaoh hears about this. And Joseph is engaging his emotions. As Christians, emotions are not bad. God gave us emotions. God expresses his will sometimes through words that, that show us that God himself has emotions. He planted them in us as his image. Joseph embraces these emotions. Pharaoh hears about it. Joseph said to his brothers, verse 3, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him. Why? Because they were terrified at his presence. I don't know why they were terrified, but I can imagine that Joseph was an impressive figure. If he was dressed up in all of his regalia, and if he was in this place of honor, and all of a sudden he's saying, I'm the guy, and you're going, but we thought he was dead, or we thought he was in slavery, or we don't know where he was on the planet. And, and these guys are just sitting there with their mouths open, slack jaws. They're like, but they're terrified. The important part to see here is not only is Joseph emotional and engaged, but the scripture lets us know that his brothers were. And those he sent out of the room were going, what's the deal? And talking to people in Pharaoh's household. It's the context of how we live our lives as human beings. This is where we live. This is what happens in our day to day. We do the same thing, hopefully. The important thing that I wanted to say and underline again is that Joseph was not afraid to be able to. He was trying to hold it in, but when he couldn't hold it anymore, he let it break. And sometimes I've had God say to me, George, you're like that guy in, in mythology, Atlas. You just want to carry the whole world. And the more you try to push up against the weight the less you're cooperating with me because I'm trying to bring you down under the weight of this so that you call out to me and see my deliverance, not yours. We like the, we've looked at the life of Joseph 
But I think it's important to realize that at this point in Joseph's life, he has faced the prejudice of slavery. He has faced the prejudice of being a young person. How can you lead this nation at this age? He has faced the prejudice of accusations that come from when you hear accusations. Our, our country right now is filled with accusations. And you cannot, we cannot imagine how strong those accusations can be in establishing prejudice against people. <clears throat> he has faced the prejudice of being a felon, having been incarcerated. He has faced the prejudice of jealousy. He has faced the prejudice that comes when someone makes an advance and you rebuff them. He has faced the prejudice that comes from classism. And he's faced the prejudice about his nationality and his race. Why is it important to realize this? Why does the scripture take us into detail to these little things, little clues? Why, does it, why is God interested in us seeing these little clues? It's because he wants us to understand a very, very important thing. And that if he's in work, he's at work even when we experience these things. And we can look for him in the middle of these circumstances. And we can engage our emotions. We don't have to harden ourselves and try to buck up under the situation. We can be who we are in the middle of these situations. And God is still on the throne and still working his plan. We can even be the brothers who are terrified. <laughs> I have a granddaughter that loves roller coasters, and I do too. I, I was at this one roller coaster with her, and we're going straight up. And I'm thinking, I cannot start screaming like a little girl because my granddaughter's next to me. <laughs> I have got to take whatever this is. And I'm thinking, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm sure I'm going to die. And she's laughing like a hyena. And I'm thinking... <laughs> She's braver than me. <laughs> we just have to embrace some stuff in life. One time, because I love roller coasters, I was talking to God about life. I was telling him I didn't like the way he was leading my life. And um, that maybe doesn't sound spiritual to some, but I think it's honest, and God loves it. And he said, why do you like roller coasters? And I said, because it's that moment when you're, you're begging God to let you live and you're promising you're never going to get on the roller coaster again. But you know you will. So he said, then why are you trusting, and I apologize to engineers, but this is the way it came to me, was why, why are you trusting an engineer to design something that could get you killed, but you can't trust me to engineer your life? You see, God is energy. He's doing stuff, and it's bigger than us. It's better than us. It's larger than us. And if we only look at Joseph's story and lay it over as if it's one person's story, we begin to miss. And chapter 45 is sort of a hinge point where, in my opinion, where, where we begin to start to see a bigger picture than just Joseph. Joseph himself says some things to his brothers. First of all, he invites them to come close. Like, if you can imagine, you know, I, 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 wor I worked uh, for a little bit with relig National Religious Broadcasters, just a volunteer, and uh, it was in the days, I, I hope this, well, it'll tell you how old I am, but Ronald Reagan was the featured speaker. And I'm, I'm standing next to Ronald Reagan, this close to Ronald Reagan, and I'm looking at him, and, and everybody, regardless of whether you liked him or not, he still was the president, and I still was pretty old. Okay. I was not going to approach him. Well, first of all, the guys with the earpieces called, uh, you know, they weren't going to let me get real close, but if he invited me and said, come up here, I, I probably would not have approached them, except with a, a certain level of, of uh, decorum and a certain level of, wow, what is happening at the moment? Joseph invites his brothers, verse 4. Come close to me. When they done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. 
don't be distressed and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Right. <laughs> because this is why I don't want you to be distressed. I don't want you to be angry with yourself. And Joseph makes this statement. It's, it's a statement that he has gone past the prejudice, past the pain, past the change, past crazy family to God sent me ahead of you. God did this. But look at what this is. It's slavery. It's ridicule. It's prejudice. It's all of these things that we think God should never lead us into. God led this guy through it. It's crazy, but it's real. And so in this situation, he says, God sent me ahead of you. And then he says, there's been this famine. He explains it to him. He says it again, just two verses later. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you, a remnant on the earth, meaning the Jewish people, and to save your life by great deliverance. It was not you who sent me here. It was God. Okay, think about the thing that you thought was so unfair. Are you there yet? It's tough. To be able to go beyond or deeper than or above, if you want to use that, past what's going on to what's really going on and finding this beautiful, powerful, delivering God in the middle of it. I've totally lost where I am on the slides, so I'm going to ignore them. But then I started thinking as I looked at this passage about the brothers. Joseph makes a very important statement. He said, God wants to do this deliverance, but you are going to have to be a part of it. He goes on and he says to them, um, I'll find it in a minute. Verse 11. If you, I have got this plan, you're going to come to Egypt. But if you don't, you are going to become destitute. And I started thinking about the family because it's so easy just to get stuck on the fact that these guys sold their brother into slavery. And as, and as um, either Craig or Chris uh, talked about the changes that went in that family and how Joseph tested this family and began to see the change of heart that was in these brothers, they had a decision to make. They were going to leave where they were, and they were going to resettle in a country known for being prejudiced against them, believing that God was going to deliver them based on a family history that was spoken to, to the forefathers that said, you are going to be in Egypt for 400 years, and then I'm going to bring you out and establish you in this land that I promised to Abraham. When you think about it, these people are being asked to do something that's incredible. You might say, well, they were starving to death. I know lots of people who are spiritually and physically starving to death, and they won't do anything about it. These people were being asked to do something. A way was being made through Joseph by God. And they were being invited to change. That is no different than the gospel. That is no different than ours being invited by the, the God of the universe through his son, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice and resurrection of his life to become to a different place, to embrace change, to find God in change. How many of you like change? I, change can be fun, but I bet you got a shirt you've been keeping in the closet and you wear it like most weekends maybe. That's your favorite shirt. You know what I'm saying? We, we, there's things we love. We love the comfort. We love change, but we love the comfort. And Joseph was asking them, will you accept the plan? Will you accept this idea? The fun thing about this story to me about is Pharaoh. I have not figured out Pharaoh and Joseph's relationship, but Pharaoh must have been a pretty cool guy 
to say, yay, your family's coming. And yet know that when they got there, they were going to be living among people that didn't really want them. To also give them an invitation to live in Goshen, which is sort of in the delta of Egypt, right up by the Mediterranean, and it's the fertile place. It's the place where livestock are going to flourish. And Joseph's saying to his brothers, when you stand before Pharaoh, tell him that you manage livestock, and he'll send you up to this place. And you are going to enjoy living there. What, we di what they didn't know is they're going to enjoy living there until Joseph dies, and then they're going to become, become, become slaves, be beaten, be mistreated, and it sets us up for the exodus. I was talking with my daughter once. She was going through a tough time, and we started talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary, you are the most blessed woman. You are going to be the mother of the, of the Messiah. Yay! <laughs> You're going to watch him. They're going to drag your reputation through the mud. You're going to be hunted. You're going to see him die the most terrible death. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Why does God do it? Sometimes I kid and say, well, next time I have children, I'm going to read the fine print. Because your whole life is invested there. It is part of life for God to call us into things that become crunchy. And then we can then sometimes begin to doubt whether or not God really called us there. Because it's tough. Or we're in a marriage that's tough. Or we're parenting kids that are more of a challenge. They just don't all go in line like ducks. Or we're in a community. Or you're working for a boss or for a company. And you kept thinking, this is going to be great. I'm going to live in Goshen. And yeah, you do for a while. And then it gets crunchy. Do you understand? Where I'm trying to lead us in this message is to see that we sometimes put these things as, as, it's, as the limiters on what God's doing. And we fail to see the bigger picture. Let's talk about crazy family for a minute, since we all admitted that we, at least most of us did, that we have some of those. I found it was really interesting, one little phrase in this portion of Scripture. And it says, when Joseph was putting them on the carts and giving them all the stuff and to go back and get the family and bring them into Egypt, he says to the brothers, don't drop out along the way. In other words, another version would say, don't start quarreling along the way. So here we go. We have brothers sell sons into, into slavery, get really hungry, go down, find out that, I mean, sell brother. They find out the brother is now the second in command. And, and in one version, um, Joseph says, I am a lord to Pharaoh which means he is really the grand vizier. They find out that he's offering forgiveness. He weeps over them. They weep over him. Uh, he, he is reunited with Benjamin, who may have been as old as 10 or 12 years old when he was sold into slavery. We don't know for sure. And in that process, Joseph testing them, finding out there was a change of heart, still knew that there was a theme of crazy. He sends his brother, his natural physical brother, it's not his half-brother, his full brother, he sends him with like extra silver, five changes of clothes. And, and I, I loved Greg's theory. I think he's still testing the brothers, and he's still knowing that they could be on the way home getting ready to sell his brother Benjamin into slavery. They could take a turn. They could go the wrong way. And so I began to think about this and how God puts us in families. And some of us have very painful histories in family. Some of us have histories that are just like you'd want them to be. And we have a tendency to think God wasn't there. Or God wasn't using it for a purpose. And one of the most beautiful things I heard just recently in the last two weeks, I was talking to someone here, and they said they came to realize 
that the way God had raised them and put them in a family, even the bad parts he was using to make something good in their life and to change them and build them into what he wanted them to be. Peter puts it this way, and I'm going to sort of close, and we're going to give a time to just let God talk to us. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter begins to talk in verse 11. This is the New International Version. Let me read it to you, please. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers. Another version says exiles. In the world, that's what we all are. Crazy family, crazy job, crazy country, crazy politics, financial challenges. Whatever it is, you could name it anything you wanted to. The bottom line is we are exiled in a world where we don't belong. We are to live as strangers and aliens, to abstain from sexual sinful desires which will wage war against your soul, to live such good works among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of he visits us. Submit yourself to the Lord's, for the Lord's sake to every authority. This is crunchy. When I read this portion of scripture, I'm going, this is tough stuff. This would be tough stuff if you fit in one of these categories. And we all do. Submit yourself to the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as a supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that it, by doing so, you should silence the, igno the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Slaves. Submit yourself to your masters with all respect, not only those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. Peter is calling us to live the life of Joseph now in our lives, facing the things that he faced. He is calling us to it, and he's saying, he committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, when he, suffered he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself this is the kernel truth. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And he bore our sins on the tree. So that we might die to sins and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For we were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseers of your souls. Live like exiles. Do what Joseph did. Embrace and cry over those who have despitefully used you. I am not saying, and I agree fully, you cannot reconcile with everyone that you forgive, but do the hard work of forgiving. Do the hard work of allowing God to show you how loved you are when you are surrounded by people who think you're not lovely or worthy or even worth to eat dinner with them. Allowing Jesus Christ to take us into a place where we are embracing change, not because we just love change, but we can know that God is changing us from glory to glory to glory to glory. And according to Romans chapter 8, his purpose, his grand purpose, is to conform you and me to the image of Christ. God is at work. 
He has a plan. That plan may put some bumps in your road. That plan may give you things to face that you would rather not face. But if you embrace the plan, as Joseph said to his brothers, you will not be destitute. You will not be broken. You will not be put to shame. So we agree with Joseph. If you've got to weep, go find a place and weep. If you've got to fall on somebody's neck and, can, and, and, and be reconciled, let that reconciliation happen. But let's let God tell his story through us. We are in a culture right now that would prefer that God writes our story the way we prefer it to be written. But the truth that has stood the test of eternity is that God's story is far superior to our story, even though some of the chapters we really wish we could rewrite. We embrace his story. So would you just stand with me as the worship team begins to play, and we'll just take a moment and, and, I, and interact with God. Let God talk with you about his story in your life about the frustration of it or about the glory of it or about how it's working well or how it's not working well. Talk to you about those that you need to forgive or those by whom you need to be forgiven. And you know that crazy person in your family who eats your lunch? What if they don't get over being crazy? How do you say, here's the boundary, and yet I'm loving you? Because God took all those things, and he's making them work for his good. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you to, to embrace us and take us into a, a deeper walk. As we have examined, and up to this point, and we'll continue to examine the life of Joseph, Lord, Lord, please, set us free from determining your hand on our life by how smooth we think it should be. And give us the ability, like Joseph, to say, God was doing this. God was behind that. Even that thing that, that threw me in prison and put me through all of these things, God, I've come to see the veil has been pulled back. Lord, I'm asking today that you will take some people who've been struggling, take us when we struggle, move us into a place where you can pull back the veil. And if we can't see it, we can put our trust in you because you are the father of lights and in you there is no shadow of turning. We ask that you do this, Lord. Now, what I'm doing is I'm going to invite you just to prepare your own heart before the Lord and just, just take a moment and just say, and, and interact with him. Lord, we want you. We want you in our lives. We want your hand over us. We want you to clear our minds. Take the eye salve of who you are in your word and apply it to our eyes so we can see differently. Joy of my 
we've got plenty of time to do it. So George hit three things. So the area of prejudice, dealing with change, and family. If any of those are things you have struggled with, you say, God, what are you doing with these things? Or why are these things even happening? If that's you, would you come forward and fill this space? I want to pray for you. shame in coming up here. We built this place so that we could do this kind of thing. There are things that happen that if you could write it differently, you would. If you've ever thought that, come forward. If you're a prayer person, a governing elder, a ministering elder, if you could come and find somebody and just pray with them. places of change and we would see more of what your Holy Spirit is up to and less of what we would desire. That in the area of our families that can be so messy and so chaotic, that God, we would see a bigger picture beyond the immediate struggle. That we wouldn't just take the past of our families and keep carrying it forward into the next generations, but generational curses would die. We ask that those things would break off in this day. to sit idly by and watch these days go on without being aware of what you're up to. So God, I ask you to meet with us. Speak to our hearts.
us with change.
do it.